All right, welcome everybody, Mr. Lee here. And today we are going to be talking about unit six of the AP Human Geography course curriculum. And within this unit, we'll be talking about the origin and history of urbanization. We'll look at different types of infrastructure and the challenges that we face as suburban sprawl becomes more of an issue across the world. I also advise you have the Quizlet open for this unit. I went ahead and put the link in the description in case I start talking about some gibber jabber that you don't quite understand. It's an excellent opportunity for review. So we're going to begin with the concepts of site and situation. And the analogy I like to use is with FPS video games, where for the most part, these video games have a bomb site and everything within the boundaries of that bomb site, the resources, the personnel is going to be a part of site. And then everything that's occurring outside of the boundaries is going to be situation. And it's completely understandable if that analogy went right over your head, because let's be real, especially for my students, their hearts stuck silver, you know who you are. Let's go to move on to some actual geography. Take the city of Los Angeles, for example. So everything within the border of LA, whether that includes the people, the resources, or Disneyland even, that's going to be a part of their site. Then you have their situation, which is everything that surrounds LA that helps its development. And that is going to include the Pacific Ocean, even the agricultural valley of Central California. And now let's go ahead and talk about the origins of urbanization. So two things needed to happen in order for societies to become sedentary. First and foremost, you needed an agricultural surplus, which means you have extra food. And with that extra food, you can feed a larger population and your population grows. Secondly, you needed a sense of social stratification. Now that's just a really complicated way of saying you needed social hierarchy. You needed leaders who are telling other people what to do and a sense of organization and structure within each society. Then let's go ahead and move on to the hearths of urbanization. There are six that you need to know and you are going to be responsible for. So you have Mesoamerica, Peru, the Nile Valley, Mesopotamia, Indus River Valley, and the Huanghe River Valley, which is also known as the Yellow River Valley. Don't get me wrong, all six of these are equally important, but the one that I've seen probably the most on the AP exam is going to be Mesopotamia, which is also known as the Fertile Crescent. And the Fertile Crescent is between the Tigris and the Euphrates River, and this civilization is known to be one of the first agricultural and urban hearths of the world. Then you have the secondary hearts of urbanization, which is going to include Greece and Rome. And at the peak of the Holy Roman Empire, the ideas of urbanization and cities spread to a lot of the modern day European countries of the world. Then those ideas of urbanization eventually spread to the New World, particularly the United States, and started at the East Coast and then with the idea of manifest destiny, spread it to the Pacific Ocean. Initially, most of the people were farmers, but with the second agricultural revolution and the mechanization of farming, a lot of people found themselves out of a job and they went into the city and the urban areas in order to work in factories. Two concepts that you're also responsible for in this unit are mega cities and meta cities. So meta cities include cities with a population of 20 million or more and mega cities include cities with a population of 10 million and more. And in the course description, there's a bit of an emphasis on the interconnectedness and the globalization that these cities are experiencing and the fact that you're seeing these cities more and more in the semi-periphery and the periphery regions of the world. And that sense of interconnectedness is called globalization and it increases economic growth by bringing jobs to your country and makes production much more affordable. So that iPhone you've been eyeing oh so badly is only $800, whereas it would have been much more expensive if it was just produced in the United States. And it brings opportunities to poorer countries. However, it causes the rich to get richer and the poor to get poorer as these corporations come in and they decimate local businesses and they exploit cheap labor markets. Two other concepts that you're responsible for in this unit are primate cities and rank size rule. And primate cities is actually a pretty simple concept. It's a country with a city that dominates both the politics and the population. For example, Mexico City, which has a population of 12 million, and then it drops off significantly afterwards. Rank size rule gets a little difficult, but the simplified definition I like to use is that the rank of the city is used as the denominator and that fraction is multiplied by the population of city number one. 
For example, if you look at the population of the United States, number one is New York with 8 million. Then you multiply that by one half, which you'll get 4 million. And you see Los Angeles is pretty close. And then you continue that multiplication with the different ranks. And there are exceptions to this rule. For example, if you look at Australia, it doesn't necessarily fit the exact rules of rank size rule, but you can still consider Australia to be a rank size rule country. Another model you want to know for this unit is the central place theory. And the central place theory explains the number, size, and location of human settlements in a particular region. So if you look at the image right here, you'll notice that there's only one city. And as you go down in the hierarchy, when you get down to the village, or sometimes they call it the hamlet, they happen more frequently and their hinterland isn't going to extend as far. In order to demonstrate the central place theory, we're going to be looking at the city of Uruapan, which is in central Mexico. And right off the bat, you should be able to notice the central place theory at play here, as the biggest cities in this region are spaced out quite far from one another. And you see the extent of their hinterland. And if we zoom in just a little bit, we'll notice that the smaller cities are much more frequent. However, the range of their cities don't extend as far as the bigger ones. So then let's go to and finally zoom in and we see quite a bit of infrastructure and you do have a bit of globalization with the Starbucks and the Pizza Hut. You have the airport and let's go to and zoom into this street, drop the little guy and we'll go to and scoot one over and I'm pretty sure this ain't Kentucky, but we got some fried chicken. We do have on the right hand side home of the sacred stuffed crust pizza and I like to use this to demonstrate a sense of placelessness that places lose their sense of identity and uniqueness as corporations take over. Then let's go ahead and drop the little guy into another major street and right off the bat we see a quite a bit of density with the residential and commercial buildings and if we go down here we'll notice the infrastructure is nicely paved and you do have some gas stations. So the hinterland of this city extends quite far and the people from this region might come into Ruapan in order to utilize the, the airport. And let's go ahead and drop into a smaller city right here. We'll notice that the goods and services that were once available like the KFC and the airport is no longer there. You do have your hotels and your banks and your restaurants, but not too many corporations. So Let's go ahead and drop the little guy right here and we'll go to move one over. Okay, let's go right here. Okay, so you see you do have your two story buildings, but you'll notice the density has significantly decreased, not only with the frequency of the buildings, but with the number of cars and people as well. And finally, let's go ahead and go to a smaller city. And from this perspective, we should notice there's even less goods and services available. And according to the model, these smaller cities will be more frequent. And if we drop the little guy right on the street here, we'll notice the streets are much more narrow due to less demand. And let's go down the street right here. And in comparison to the previous city, you have even smaller buildings and stores, which is in line with the central place theory. And last but not least, we're going to go ahead and go over some urban models, starting with the concentric zone, which was modeled after Chicago. And you'll see that it begins with the CBD, then you have your lower class and then your middle class and upper class. For a lot of these urban models, a pattern you're going to notice is that the lower class is generally not next to the upper class. Then we have the sector model, which looks like pieces of a pie. And you'll notice two things were added to this model, which is going to be transportation and industry. Now, the transportation that the sector model is referring to is actually not cars. It's talking about the railway system. And the reason why the lower class is next to the industrial sites is because it was theorized that the lower class would go to these industrial sites to work. And finally, we have the multiple nuclei model, which takes into consideration the use of cars and automobiles. A couple different things that you want to notice here is that you have your central business district and your manufacturing areas. So the green and the light orange over here, they're actually next to the lower class. And it's once again, building on this idea that the lower class can't afford to move further away from the pollution. And if you look at the residential suburbs, they're much further out and the upper class tends to be away from the manufacturing areas. And 
This takes into consideration the idea of suburbanization. And because of automobiles, you had regional development outside of the CBD, as you can see with the outline business district. All right, that is it for today. In part two of urbanization, we're going to be going over some foreign urban models and sustainable development. So have a fantastic day, everyone.